So the last shock that we can study uh, after aggregate demand shock, so which starts by affecting the aggregate demand, technology shock that affect both the aggregate supply and the labor demand. So they affect uh, you know, the bridge between product market and labor market. Now we can look at exactly on the other side, we can look at labor um, supply shocks. Um, then we would have covered everything, you know, shocks that affect aggregate demand, shocks that affect aggregate supply labor demand. Of course, you know, they have the same determinant and then shocks that affect the labor uh, the labor supply. Um, so let's consider um, positive, a positive labor supply shock. So what's a positive labor supply shock? That's an increase in um, the labor supply. Uh, or, you know, here it's an increase in H, which is the labor force, uh, the size of the labor force. So if you have a bigger labor force, um, of course that's going to boost your uh, that's going to boost your labor supply. Uh, so that's what we're considering. So again, you remember that uh, our model. So I'm going to give you the two equation again. Uh, our model at the end boils down to a two by two system that determines product market tightness, labor market tightness with two equations. These two equations that we've now seen a couple of times. Um, so let me repeat them here. So first, we know that we have from the labor market size that product market tightness has to be a function XL uh, of theta that's equal to F minus 1, W over P, and alpha, H1 minus alpha. So we see that our shock here is going to affect this equation because we have H here, F hat theta, uh, 1 minus alpha, 1 plus star hat theta, alpha. Okay, and then the second equation, x has to be a function xp of theta, that's tau minus 1 t epsilon mu alpha divided by w h 1 over f hat of theta 1 over epsilon minus 1 minus 1. Here you see H also shows up here. So uh, this is a bit uh, more tricky than what we've seen before because here um, you can see that H, which we are going to here increase, appears here and it also appears here. Um, so now our two curves uh, that determine the solution of the model are affected by uh, the shock to H. So graphically, let's see what's going to happen. Okay, so as usual, we have x, the vertical axis tightness here. We have our two equation. So this uh, downward sloping is xp of theta. This upward sloping curve is xl of theta. And then we have the solution of the model. At the intersection. Uh, remember, of course, XP sometimes crosses uh, the horizontal axis and sometimes gives a, um, gets a horizontal asymptote that's uh, positive. But in any case, you know uh, the structure of the model always looks something like this. And we can read X here and we can read theta here at the intersection. Okay, uh, right. So now let's look at uh, let's look at what's going to happen. So first of all, so here we're considering an increase in the labor force. So H goes up. Uh, that means that everything in our first equation in Excel in the parentheses is going to go up. F minus 1. So again, this function F minus 1 and tau minus 1, these are these two functions are increasing function. So H goes up. Everything in the parentheses goes up. F minus 1 times what's in the parentheses tend to be higher. So the curve XL is going to be higher. So we'd have a shift up like this. Okay. Um, so when the labor force uh, goes up, our curve XL is going to uh, you know, rotate up around zero here. What about XP? So H is here in the denominator. If H is higher, everything 
is going to be lower in our parentheses term one is one is increasing, so everything is going to be lower. So the curve XP on the other hand is going to uh, is going to be lower everywhere. This we know is not affected by H uh, it's XM, so it's going to look something like this. So XP is going to go down. So where is our new equilibrium? It's going to be here. We will have a new theta here and we'll have a new X here. So what's key is that we see that, of course, um, given that XL is higher, XP, uh, XP is lower, labor market tightness is necessarily lower. Okay, so there is, uh, there is no doubt because both curves, uh, both curves are kind of you know shifting inward, uh, closer to the vertical axis. So what we can see is that uh, necessarily, uh, after, oops, after an increase in labor force. H, what do we have? Uh, we can see that necessarily labor market tightness theta, oops, uh, the labor market tightness theta is going to go down. Okay, uh, because we have two curves that are uh, kind of shifting closer to the vertical axis. So that's unambiguous. Okay, and so if theta goes down, we know a bit what's going to happen. So uh, we know that the job finding probability is going to go down. We know that the unemployment rate, one minus f of theta, that's going to go up. We know that the matching wage, the hat of theta, uh, is going to go down. We know that the recruiting probability, q of theta, that's going to go up. Okay. Um, so we have a labor market that's um, for sure uh, less slack, so with uh, more unemployment. Uh, so that, you know, that we can tell. Um, okay, now, um, what we cannot tell, though, is what hap happens to X, um, because here, um, when the curve XL shifts up, that tends to uh, raise X, um, so X tends to go up when XL goes up, but then when the curve XP shifts down, that tends to lower X. So here, just by looking at the curve, one of the shift is going to lead to a higher x, the other shift is to a lower x. We don't know what happens to x. So here we'd have to be nimble and use other relationships. Or, you know, basically we have to use like combinations of xl and xp, the appropriate combination of these two equations to figure out what happens to x. So we have to, you know, like use all our knowledge of the model and all our relation to be able to, here's the only thing we know for sure is theta falls. And from that and all our knowledge of the model, we have to back out what happens to, the, to all the other equations. And here, unfortunately, we can't just use X, the two functions XL and XP because they leave conflicting results on what happened to X. But in fact, what happens to X, we know what's going to be. There'll be like, a, it's not unknown and depending on the parameter of the model, there'll be a one unique response of X, but we can't see it here from this equation. We have to do a bit of work and use different equations to figure out what happens. And of course, all the equations are, you know, we already know them, we've derived them, but some of them are kind of lying in the background. We have to bring them back to figure out how um, X is going to respond. Um, so how are we going to do? So here we have to really be nimble and, and use our understanding of the model to see just using the fact that labor market ideas go do goes down to figure out everything else. So one thing we, we can use is, um, uh, we can figure out what happens to employment, not by looking at the labor supply, because in the labor supply, the labor supply shifts out and tightness falls, so you have two effects that are uh, going in the opposite direction, but we can look at the labor demand. So you know that L employment always has to be on the labor demand, and our labor demand uh, equation 
Uh, let me pull it out somewhere. Yes, our labor demand equation actually uh, will allow us to figure out what happens to employment because the labor demand equation is not affected by a shift to the labor supply. So the labor demand curve is not going to move and we're just going to move along it when tightness moves. And here in particular, tightness falls. So we're going to move down the labor demand curve. It means that we'll have higher employment. Um, and so in fact, L, we know that it's uh, on the labor uh, demand curve. Oh. oh, actually, we can't do that either because um, the labor demand curve depends on tightness, X, but we don't know what has happened to X yet. So actually, my bad, I can't use directly the labor demand uh, equation. I have to use something else. So um, what we can... Basically, one way that we can show what happens to X is uh, to do a little reasoning where uh, we're going to assume that, uh, a little reasoning by contradiction. So we're going to assume that X uh, goes up, the uh, product market tightness goes up, and we'll see that it actually leads to an inconsistency. And therefore, you know, we'll be able to conclude that uh, X actually goes down uh, and, and then we can back out everything. Um, so this is a little subtle. Um, so let's assume we uh, reason by contradiction. So assume that X goes up. What happens here when, uh, you know, when uh, the labor force goes up? So if X goes up, all right. So one thing I know is that output Y has to fall. Uh, because that's using the aggregate demand curve. So I know that Y is on the aggregate demand, which is <coughs> key epsilon one plus tau X, epsilon minus one, U over P. And so, because here I've assumed that X goes up, I've assumed that tau X goes up and uh, epsilon minus one is positive. So I've assumed that the whole denominator goes up. Um, so Y has to fall, because okay, so that would be a natural consequence here. Okay, then the second thing that we uh, talked about earlier is that in this model, the labor share is always equal to, uh, to alpha. Uh, that's something that we had derived by reworking uh, the labor demand equations and using the production function. So we know that uh, the labor share, which is WL over P times Y, that's equal to alpha. Okay, now under my assumption that X goes up, Y falls. And given that prices and wages are fixed and alpha is fixed, it has to be that L falls. There's just no way around it. So L is going to go down in a world like this where um, the product market tightness goes up. Okay. But then, as I was saying earlier, L is on the labor demand. Um, so L has to be rid of the labor demand. Now the labor demand is f of x, um, a alpha divided by the real wage, w over p, one over one minus alpha times one over one plus tau hat of theta, alpha over one minus alpha. So this is, uh, you know, this is also just true because this is just the labor demand equation. Now here under our little thought experiment, uh, assuming that X goes up. So if X goes up, F of X is going to go up. You know, the selling probability goes up. So that tend to boost labor demand. We said that tau hat of theta, uh, we said that theta fell, so tau hat of theta is going to go down the matching way. So it's, you know, for firms that tends to also boost their, their uh, you know, their labor demand because it's easier to recruit. Um, so if tau hat goes down one over one plus tau hat of theta to the power of alpha over one minus alpha. So this whole thing here, this is going to go up. A doesn't change, alpha doesn't change, W over P doesn't change. So this whole thing is going to go up because f of x goes up. So here we infer that uh, by reading off the labor demand, we infer that L goes up. And so here we've reached a contradiction because we said that L had to go down you, oh, sorry. 
using the labor share argument, we said that L had to go down. But then using the, and then looking at what happened on the labor demand, we found that L has to go uh, up. So here we've reached a contradiction. It means that uh, the model equation cannot all be uh, cannot all be satisfied if x goes up. So you know something is breaking down because we used like we went one way, found that l should go up, then we went another way looking at level demand, we found that l should go down. Uh, you know, and so it's not possible that L both goes up and L both goes down. And so assuming that X goes up leads to a contradiction. Uh, and so we reach a contradiction, so it has to be that X is going to go down. Uh, so it has to be that when we have an increase in the labor force, H, uh, labor market tightness goes down, it has also to be that product market tightness goes down. And so, uh, a, labor, a positive labor supply shock at the exact opposite uh, effect as uh, a, a, a positive um, aggregate demand shock on the tightnesses. When you have more aggregate demand, the two markets, labor and product markets, are tighter. Here, when you have a more aggregate, su uh, more labor supply on the other side, uh, the two markets are less uh, tight, they are slacker. And of course, this makes a lot of sense because one boosts the general aggregate demand, the other one boosts um, the general kind of aggregate supply. And so these two things have opposite effect on the tightnesses. Uh, okay, so X is going to fall. Um, so now what about uh, output? Well, so here I can use the arguments I've just made earlier and being smart about them. So output Y, we can read it off of the aggregate demand. So output is key epsilon, one plus tau x, epsilon minus one, mu over p. So this is the aggregate demand here. I should have said, here this is our labor demand. And this was the aggregate demand. Okay, and so we've said that x fall, so we've said that tau x is going to fall. And so as a result, output is going to go up because that's in the denominator. Okay, so uh, that's interesting. So we have a lower product market like this, but we have a higher output. And then of course, then now we can go back to our labor share equation. It says that the labor share WL divided by P times Y, that's alpha. Now we've just said that output goes up. So it has to be that employment goes up. So here we have a positive aggregate, a positive labor supply shock. And so much like the aggregate demand shock, it leads to higher output, it leads to higher uh, employment, but unlike an aggregate demand shock, actually all the markets are slacker. Um, so we saw that product market tightness falls and labor market tightness falls. Um, and so that's quite interesting if you, so, Let's say you see a shock that leads to higher output, and we saw positive aggregate demand shock, positive technology shock, positive labor supply shock. They all lead to higher. Uh, they all lead to higher output, um, and in fact, they also all lead to higher employment. So all of these shocks they give you more output, more employment. But we said that by looking at what happens on the product market, you can separate aggregate demand from technology. Um, but then by looking at what happens on the labor market, you can separate technology. Um, an aggregate demand shock from labor supply shock because the labor supply shock is the only shock that leads to bigger quantities but a lower labor market tightness. Um, so we can kind of summarize all these findings. So it's quite interesting. Uh, and of course, I should have said, so this one, you know, the fact that X falls we, you know, it means that the selling probability is going to be lower. So 
So f of x is going to fall. It means that the rate of idleness is going to increase and so on and so forth. It means that the matching wage is going to fall and so on and so forth. Uh, here, same thing. We could also, you know, last time we also said what happens to consumption. So consumption is output divided by 1 plus tau x. Output's higher, the matching wage is lower, so um, consumption will have more consumption here. Uh, and in fact, we can also know what happens the number of producers. Number of producers is number of employment divided by the matching wage on the uh, labor market. But employment goes up, the matching wage goes down because the labor market is slacker. So we know that the number of producers is also going to go up. Uh, <clears throat> so we know all these things here. Uh, and so alas, uh, yes, and uh, and so we have all this we have all these interesting things. So we had seen how to separate demand from technology, and we we can see here uh, how we can separate uh, labor supply shocks from technology and aggregate demand shock. Basically, labor supply labor supply shock is the only shock that leads to higher employment L but lower labor market tightness. So in fact, you know, if you wanted to identify shocks, you would first look at the link between employment and labor market tightness. If these two are positively correlated, you can rule out labor supply shock. If they are negatively correlated, then you know it is about labor supply shock. So it's quite, and that's why, you know, looking at tightnesses is so key. So you can do that. And then, you know, if it's labor supply shock, it's labor supply shock. If you're ruled out, then you're left with technology and aggregate demand. And then to differentiate them, you know that you have to look at the product market. Uh, on the product market, you can look at what happens to at the correlation between output and product market tightness. With aggregate demand shock, it's positive correlation. With technology shock, it's a negative correlation. And so you can uh, you can do you can do that. And then so in order you can uh, you can separate between labor supply, uh, technology, and aggregate demand shock. Um, notice that both labor supply shock and technology shock leads to higher output but lower. Uh, but lower product market tightness. So the only shock that gives you higher output and higher uh, product market tightness is the aggregate demand shock. So we can, uh, you know, that's something that you can use to separate uh, all these shocks. And in fact, if you look at uh, my paper on aggregate demand, idle time, and unemployment, this type of argument using correlation between quantities and tightnesses is exactly what we use to separate different shocks. The conclusion that we reach is that business cycles are mostly about aggregate demand shocks. <clears throat> 